Okay, so I've identified the Great Chain of Cope. Are you aware of the Great Chain of Cope? No? Well, you know what Cope is, right? Yeah. And yeah. There's, there's a lot of it. And it seems that there is a progression of Cope, mainly from childless women, a lot of whom get to the point where they hit their 40s or sometimes even their 50s and realize all of these bad decisions they've made throughout their lives. Oh, and they yeah. decide misery loves company. And so they say, all of the bad decisions that I've made I'm going to encourage younger women to make. And therefore, they will make the bad decisions that I've made, validating my own terrible life. Particularly they're editors of, of magazines that sell well to young women. Yes. And I want to be clear that I'm not trying to be malicious against some of these women who've written the articles that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Just because some of them have reached their 40s and gone through IVF treatment, for instance, and been able to have children. And it's quite sad to me that they've reached the point in their lives where they've realized, actually, I do want something a bit meaningful. I do want something a bit more. But I'm also going to encourage women to take the same choices that I did, where I'm basically just going to wait until the very last minute to do so at incredible expense through medical treatments that are only going to work some of the time. And the mental toll. And the mental toll of it. We had a lovely subscriber well, send us an email a while back where he was just talking about this. He was like, this is not what you would want for yourself, and I wouldn't advise it for anyone to have to go through IVF rather than being able to just have children at a sooner time. Yes. Once again, I'm glad that some of these women have made the choices to have children and do something more meaningful. But still, there's some recognitions in these articles that I'll look at where you just think to yourself, okay, you should be encouraging women to not make these decisions because a lot of them are going to get to the point where they're frozen their eggs, go for IVF, anything like that in their mid-40s, and it just won't work. So... Let's not encourage women to make these bad decisions, but these women are encouraging women to make bad decisions, therefore justifying all of their own. And talking about women's decisions, um, what you want to watch, obviously, is a video of a load of men, a load of manly men, including this, this man right here, mm. talking about the trad wife question on the recent trend of TikTok and other social media platforms putting women out there or women choosing to put themselves out there as trad wife characters where they're encouraging the virtues of the more traditional life where you stay in, you make dinner and sandwiches in the kitchen for your husband. He goes out and earns the money for you and you have lots of bountiful, beautiful children together. And baked bread. And baked bread. Yes. And uh, it seemed very interesting. There was a bit of a contention. As you can see, it's, been, it's got quite a few views and it's got a lot of comments. It's got lots of comments, most of which are trying to tell off Rory for having a different opinion. So would you like to discuss a little bit of this, Dan, and say what, what value people can get from this? Um, so basically, Carl and I was arguing that, that trad thottery, you know, the, these women who sort of you know, do the trad thing on Instagram or whatever, is, is a positive because the culture is now so debauched where we are now that pulling us back in the right direction through this is better than, you know, blue hair and camel toes and whatever else you get on Instagram. Whereas Rory was basically arguing it's not good enough and therefore kill it with fire. Would you say that's a fair summation of his stance? Yes. All right, fair yes. play. Well, if you want to watch that, it's yeah. uh, subscribers only and you can subscribe to the website for as little as £5 per month. So the premium lads hours have been very popular so far. I think they've been quite the hit. They're certainly one of my favorite shows to appear on. So you should definitely watch that. And let's get into what I'm talking about. So this is off the back of some articles that have been released recently. This one, for instance, came out yesterday. And I know what you're thinking. The Guardian is not exactly a virtuous place to find good news and excellent takes, but it is a place to observe people trying to justify their own bad decisions. The cope, I mean, you haven't even read any of it yet, but the cope is strong. Yeah, the, the cope is very strong just from the headline alone. So this is Emma Gannon saying, I've chosen to be child-free. Here is how I plan to build a life full of joy and meaning. And, you know, I'm glad that you're deciding that you'll need to fill the gaping hole in your life. Um, but this is Emma right here. Uh, I'm, I will make no comment. But let's read through a little bit of this and see what we can learn. So she says straight away, the subheading, even though I'm happy with my decision to not have children, not having kids can sometimes make me feel untethered. So I've built a list of alternative milestones. So, like I say, I don't think people like Emma would have made the life decisions that she has to decide to be child-free at the age that she is, had there not been a whole generation or two of women before, probably influenced by second-wave feminism, 
saying this is a good thing. You want to just entirely focus on a career. You want to be a career woman. Yes. You want to be a high-powered girl boss. That's what gives you meaning. You, like, you don't want to be answering to a man and a child. You want to be answering to your boss. Yes. Who will replace you the moment it becomes convenient. And pay for your abortion if you happen yes. to get pregnant by accident. Which is how you know someone really cares about you. Um, yeah, they've, they've got two generations or so of women who've been encouraging that lifestyle and that cultural pressure that that builds on them. Telling them that, well, if I do have the trad lifestyle, if I have a, a husband and children, then that, that's actually going to be me chained down to the patriarchy. Whereas if I work for the high-powered corporation who doesn't actually care about me, that's not me being oppressed, that's me being liberated. So without yes. those kinds of cultural pressures, women like this probably wouldn't have made the same decisions that they have. But now they're in the position where they've made these decisions, you can't just admit to yourself, I was tricked. I've given myself a life without meaning. You have to think to yourself, I've got to justify this somehow. It, it's not my fault. Well, and the other it's thing, the of course, children is, who are wrong. I mean, you guys are in your 20s, but I mean, w women, once they get into their sort of 30s, and especially towards the end of their 30s, the baby rabies come on really strong. And we so, get a bit of that in these articles here. Yeah, well, so for, the, for this woman to have pushed through that, and then that must have taken a, a, a quite a substantial force of will. So the, the need to cope strong is going to be... And, and even then, yeah. it, you can see through what I'll read that it only takes the slightest comment to chip away at that armor that she's built around herself and knock it all down and it all comes crumbling. I can so, imagine. So she says, a friend came over for dinner recently and brought her newborn daughter. She was adorable, giggling, drooling, and kicking her legs with gusto. My husband and I are very open about the fact that we don't want to have children. I am child-free by choice, and it feels like an important distinction to make. I've never tried to get pregnant. I have no idea how my body would work or not work in that department. It will probably always remain a mystery. And uh, you can tell that it's something that's just completely natural, and she's perfectly happy with that because she has to write articles in The Guardian justifying it to everybody around her. I've realized recently, though, the reality of my situation. She goes on about how her friends talk about the milestones that you get to live through your children. You get to relive your own milestones when the mm. child first walks, when you take them to a theme park for the first time, and you get to relive that childlike wonder that you experienced as a child. And she realizes that she won't have any of that herself. So she says, I will never have these milestones that come with having children, even though I'm sure I don't want to have kids, which is like a repeated mantra. It's like a chant that she gives to herself. I'm sure I don't want kids. I don't want kids. A period of existential worry has crept up on me. The feeling that I've somehow already ticked off all of, my life, uh, all of my life's big moments. Last year, I got married, tick, bought a house, tick. And then there was a feeling of, what next? I was haunted by a conversation I had with a woman who worked at a beauty counter who, as she applied wax to my eyebrows, asked me if I had children. When I replied, no, and that I don't think I want to have them, see how it's already chipping away slightly. I'm sure I don't want to have them. I think I don't want to have them, even in the context of this one article. She said, I hope you have enough to fill your life with. Life is very long. Yeah. All of it exploded. Would that one sentence, that one recommendation, fill your life with something then? All comes crashing to a like, oh God, my life is meaningless now. Because your, your career trajectory is pretty much where it's going to be by the mid 30s i mean there's a few more promotions to come but basically you know you, you're, you're you're probably you're, financially set you're comfortable yeah. enough you've she's married so she already yeah. has a home life set up so it's not like she's going to go out dating and experiencing new things that yeah. way so what is there now and then you've got another 45 years of stagnation yeah and, and that's the thing i you know uh, sometimes we go into these articles with a feeling of rubbing it in their faces but i genuinely feel quite sad reading things like this, because I think to myself that these life decisions that you've made wouldn't have been the ones that you'd, made, you'd have made in a vacuum, in all likelihood. They've been foisted onto you by the culture that you've grown up in, and now you're left to pick up the baggage and find out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Obviously, life doesn't have to be meaningless in these circumstances, but it's going to be much more difficult to try and fill your life with meaning yeah. in this situation. So here, here's the things that she's decided to do. And Tell me if this, these aren't, if I'm perfectly honest with you, the most basic bitch things that you could imagine to try and do to fill your life with. In fact, actually, before I go, give me a guess at what she's going to do. Instead of having milestones that she can live with her children, what do you two think that she's going to do to well, fill you, her life with me? You set it up by saying it's, it's really basic. So I'm imagining having a lie-in, um, getting drunk, 
I mean, she's going to go on dinner. holiday to Spain. Yeah. Callum's the closest so far. So the number one, first one, is make your dream travel list. And this is even, even worse here because she says, I've started an epic list of places I could, uh, to go and things to see. It feels so good to write down these ideas and locations, even if financially or log- uh, logistically they're not possible now or in the near future. So it's not even that I'm going to go and do it. It's that I hope maybe to one day Sorry, my, how- my boss will maybe be able to afford to give me a raise so that I can do this. How crap is her job? Because one of them is going to Scotland. It's not the most expensive I don't know. thing you could ever you could do. You do that on a bus. Right. From, just... from this picture, it looks like, as, ridic- as much as it looks like she's wearing a tablecloth, <laughs> this is probably quite expensive fashion. So she could probably afford it, but it's just weird that it's not the desire. It's, it's not the going and doing this thing. It's the desire to go and do things. It's the, I'm going to write a list and the list will make me feel better, disconnected from the actions. Yeah, she, this is somebody who's living entirely in the future rather than today. And he, I wouldn't even say that because part of the joy of planning a holiday is that you plan for the future and then when you get to the future, you get to go and do it. She is living entirely in the moment of, I have written this list and this list has made me feel better right now. Hmm. So I, I would say it's the opposite of what you're saying is that she's possibly getting the, gra- uh, she's getting the satisfaction from the list and not the potential future action. Very, very strange. It's just also hollow. Yeah, she, she also has measure your life in knowledge, which is a fancy way of saying get a hobby. I'm going to indulge in hobbies. Okay, that's fair. You can get a lot of reward from doing hobbies. I particularly enjoy playing music. That's always a good one. Look beyond family. For Ruby Warrington, the author of the book Women Without Kids, that's why you've made these life choices as you are mi- reading books like that. That's why you make bad decisions, is if you read books called things like Women Without Kids, if you see a loved one, a a female loved one, reading books like that, slap it out of her hand straight away because you are going to save her a lifetime of sorrow. The only milestones women without children are allowed are seemingly menopause, retirement, and death. Being child-free, she says, helped her to experience life more as one long, ever-evolving moment that will bring all sorts of challenges and shifts in opportunities. But it's not evolving though, is it? It's pretty stagnant. Yes. And, and also, hollow. And, and you see that it's one long, ever-evolving moment. You live entirely in the moment, entirely in the present, with no thought to the past or the future. Everything is just as it is right now with no attempt to change, even if you convince yourself that it's going to be ever-evolving. Your life is the same forever and ever and ever. This is terrible advice. Don't listen to women who write books. And this is where the chains are. You can start to see the links is that feminism creates women like Ruby Warrington who write books like Women Without Kids, women like this on the promise from the culture that it will be liberating if she reads books like Women Without Kids and indulges in that lifestyle, read that, get terrible ideas, and then go on to write articles like this, which encourage more women to think to themselves, I can have a fulfilling life if I make these life decisions, even though this is cope. Yes, it's bad, it's bad enough having done this to herself, but the fact that she's trying to push this on other young women and hold this up as an example, it would be much more honest if she just said, I'm desperately sad with my life choices. Please don't copy me. But you can't be honest, because if you're honest to yourself, the entire facade of your life yes. cl- uh, collapses. But in the, in the avoidance of being honest, she's trying to doom other young women into this sort of um, nine to five grind, which they will become immensely dissatisfied with and leave. And even then, with all of this, the maternal instinct still kicks in because one of the yes. suggestions is build purpose, celebrating your life for how you can help others to be, uh, can be really powerful. Helping others. So I doubt she does that. There's, I, I doubt it as well, but let's be fair. Yeah. That's a, That's the maternal instinct. I want to help others. I want to be there for other people. I want to help other people. You, you know the way that that maternal instinct... You want surrogate instinct, children, the way you're saying. Yeah, She's yes. going to get lots of dogs and cats. Well, no, it's worse than that, because the maternal instinct manifests, and, and you can see this clearly in the voting instincts and opinion polls, the maternal instinct in childless women manifests as, let's have as many immigrants as we can. Yes, because they're basically overgrown children that I can yep. nanny. And then what happens is, and again, you can see this from the polling data, the moment they have kids, um, 
they suddenly flip. They're now anti-immigration. So child, childless women are the most dangerous voting block of them all. And I think, I mean, connecting this, this up, I think that's why they had to go after Russell Brand so hard, because he was speaking to that segment, which is basically the, the glowing nucleus of left-wing politics, single young women. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 it results in, in this sort of monstrosity. Yeah, and then what happens when a woman like this, if she's not already, hits her 40s? Well, she decides, actually, actually, I did want children the entire time. And that's why we get articles like this from The Independent, from Charlotte Cripps saying, your 40s is the perfect decade to have your first child. It's I'm, really not. I'm living my best life. And with, with this, once again, I am very happy for Charlotte that she has been able to go through IVF treatments and have children, as she explains in this article. She says that she's in her 40s, tragically the man that she was trying to conceive with, with the IVF, took his own life while they were going through the process. So it's all quite oh, a tragic situation. But as a result of the treatment, she was able to have two daughters. And they're healthy and they're happy. And that's fantastic for her. Yes. But realistically speaking, IVF, as I've mentioned earlier, is very, very expensive and yes. not always guaranteed. And I looked at Well, and it's, it's really hard physically on the woman as well. It is very it's, it's a tough thing to go through and you spend a bloody fortune on it. And then if you hit if if you're between the age of 40 and 42, the chances of it succeeding are 9.4%. With, with IVF. With IVF. Wow. You're past 42, it drops to 6%. Wow. Okay. So th this woman, Charlotte, she does actually acknowledge that, the, that there are difficulties, she says. Yeah. Of course, there are so all sorts of advantages to having children in your 20s and 30s. A huge bonus is that you're simply more fertile. She explains the costs of it. If I go, oh, bloody hell. Sorry, just boomering it. Um, she talks about how it's very, very expensive. It's, uh, let's see, £4,000 to £7,000 in the UK. A lot of women aren't just going to have that at hand especially if they've chosen to be single. I know that this woman didn't, but a lot of women who are going through this will choose to be single to try and go through this process. So you've chosen to be child-free, and then you hit your 40s or maybe your late 30s, and your biology, your body is screaming to you. The compulsion is too I strong. I really to want children, actually. I've made so well, many mistakes. And, and raising kids alone is bloody hard. I mean, it's hard enough when there's two of you. Yes. Obviously, this woman wouldn't have raised them alone if she, if her Yes. partner hadn't, um, hadn't yes. taken his own life. But she sounds like, she says at the end here, it's actually quite sweet in a, in a way. She says, every day since becoming a mum, I've embraced the mess and chaos and appreciate every minute. I'm sure my younger self would cringe at the thought of me spending my evenings helping my children with my homework, with their homework, but I'm proud to say that I'm living my best life. I'm really happy yeah. for her that she's been able to do that. But it, but it would have been nice if she hadn't been fed a constant stream of propaganda when she was in her 20s and 30s and early 30s so that she could have come to this realization a decade earlier. Yes. And so, as I've, as I've said, childless, I'm, I've chosen to be child-free. Actually, I want children. And also, unlike Charlotte, a lot of these women are going to say, I'm single because I, I was too busy working my high-powered girl boss job to even think about getting into a relationship. So what happens? They say it's oppression that I'm not being given this by the taxpayer that my IVF treatment, being as expensive as it is, isn't being subsidized for me by other people's productive contributions to the economy. So this is an interesting one. Nicole Collarbone never thought she would be a single mother, but as she neared her 40th birthday, she knew she no longer wanted to wait to meet her partner to have a baby. She decided to have IVF with a sperm donor, but with the steep price of fertility treatment and no one to share the costs with, Nicole hoped she could at least get part of it on the NHS. Why? Because Why does she hope that? Because you have to subsidize other people's poor life choices. You didn't go and have sex and have kids, so someone else needs to pay for magic. Yes. The expensive magic that is modern medicine. Just the way is you and I need to pay taxes so that foreigners can be imported and given free housing in London, meaning that we could never afford to live in London. Women who decide not to have children until it's too late and then have a costly and very inconsistent medical procedure to try and have children when it's too late, we need to pay for that as well. Every single time. She's among a rising number of single women choosing solo motherhood. Terrible idea. Absolutely terrible idea. Children... Well, sorry, that doesn't exist. Like, you have the magic, 
of modern medicine to be able to do that. Yes. That is an amazing privilege and you have to pay for it. The idea you're in any other society in any other time, you could be a solo mother. It doesn't exist. What are you talking about? Also, it's just not good for the children. I'm sure yeah. that if, if you're watching this and you're a single mother from circumstances that aren't under your control, I sympathize with you and understand how difficult that must be. But if you have the choice, if you're able to make the reasoned decision, you should have children in a, a mother and father, two-parent household, because that is what's best for the children. There is a 44% increase in women with no partner doing IVF between 2019 and 2021, according to the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. And I'm sorry to have to break this to, to uh, say it this way, but that's almost certainly going to be a 44% increase in young boys and girls identifying as the opposite gender. Let's be perfectly honest. The kind of life decisions that will lead to these women mm. so choosing solo motherhood when they get into their 1940s is going to be a result of the same kind of social attitudes that go straight into that kind of And idea. of course, the other thing we haven't touched upon is, you know, what's wrong with adoption? Or, That's a good question. Uh, or, or fostering. You know, there, there's lots of ways that you could play the maternal role um, without, without doing this. And we've also got to advocate institutional change in here as well because uh, some say it's unfair because over half of the NHS England integrated care boards which decide on who can get fertility treatment locally don't include a single woman on them. So we need to get more women in the institution so that women can choose to give themselves more free money. Free money from the taxpayer. Yeah. I want Story money. Story of democracy. Okay. Yep. That, that is all democracy has ever really been about, getting political power so you can pay yourself more things. But don't worry. At the bottom here, the government has said that uh, local health services in England follow guidelines with the National Institute for Health and Care excellence and a review of these guidelines is expected next year. So they will probably say we need to be giving single women who've made terrible decisions with their lives more free money from the taxpayer. So that's something to look forward to. So that's a, that's a quick tour down the links of the great chain of cope. I hope that's made everyone, uh, I, I've, I hope I've appropriately brought everybody down after the laugh riot that was Dan's <laughs> segment. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site such as the Brokenomics series, this episode on Gaza. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Twitter at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter. Thank you and goodbye.